Welcome. Thank you for being here. Before we start tonight, I would like to remind you all that you are invited to come down to the Ariccio Lounge after John Callahan's talk and have a drink with us, a water, a wine, a scotch, whatever you would like, and join us. Meet the people who talk today at the Albert Murray, um, Albert Murray Symposium called Albert Murray and the Aesthetic Imagination of a Nation. Uh, we've got scholars from all over the place here today. Uh, these are mostly people who know Albert Murray, Murray personally. Um, I think there's just all kinds of interesting stories to hear if you're interested in Murray, if you're interested in Ellison, and probably nobody knows Ellison or knew Ellison better than our speaker today. In the late 1930s, just down the road from here at Tuskegee Institute, two of the most important literary intellectuals of the 20th century first encountered each other. Albert Murray and Ralph Ellison didn't formally meet as students, but they did cross paths here in Alabama in the stacks of the Hollis Burke Forsell Library, a library which had been painstakingly assembled by dedicated librarians and teachers who believed in the high aspirations of their students. Murray and Ellison went on to become dear friends, confidants, and sometimes fierce sparring partners as they fulfilled the grand hopes of their mentors by co-authoring one of the most profound cultural critiques of American identity as we have come to know it today. The two were intellectual co-conspirators who, through brilliant and elegant literary statements, subverted long-held false assumptions about the foundation of the American aesthetic imagination. Both authors relied on blues metaphors to underscore the undeniable black presence at the core of American art. Our speaker this evening, Dr. John F. Callahan, has personally known both authors well. He has referred to himself as a son of Murray and Ellison and considers himself a literary heir to their legacies. John Callahan first met Ralph Ellison in 1977 after sending the reclusive author a copy of his essay, Chaos, Complexity, and Possibility, The Historical Frequencies of Ralph Waldo Ellison. Callahan's essay so impressed Ellison that the author invited him to his home where he became a frequent visitor. After Ellison's death, his widow, Fanny Ellison, selected Dr. Callahan as literary executor of Ellison's estate, and so bestowed upon him 40 years' worth of materials, representing the writer's fury that had prevented Ellison from completing his long-awaited follow-up to Invisible Man. Besides the fact that Ellison wrote furiously, his writing style was affected by the advent of the computer, which allowed him to tinker incessantly with every aspect of the unfinished novel. From over 80 computer disks and thousands of typed pages and scribbled notes, Dr. Callahan produced Juneteenth, which represents only part of Ellison's unfinished novel. Dr. Callahan also published the collected essays of Ralph Ellison and Flying Home and Other Stories. In addition to these works, Dr. Callahan also edited with Albert Murray, Trading Twelves, the selected letters of Ralph Ellison and Albert Murray. These fascinating letters reveal the true collaborative nature and the commonality of vision and purpose that helped the Tuskegee-bred authors redefine together, in concert, their concept of American identity. Tonight, Dr. Callahan will talk about Albert Murray's contributions to their shared concept, Murray's unique omni-American cultural perspectives, and hopefully also Murray's uncanny take on American art. Will you please welcome a personal friend of Albert Murray and Ralph Ellison, a novelist who recently published A Man You Could Love, which you can buy outside of the door, and please do, and come by to the reception afterwards and have Dr. Callahan sign it. The nationally acclaimed scholar of American and African American literature, a political activist, and the Morgan S. O'Dell Professor of Humanities at Lewis and Clark College in Portland, Oregon, Dr. John F. Callahan.
to borrow a chant from Barack Obama's campaign, I'm fired up <laughs> and ready to go. Uh, um, and I think that I don't make that reference lightly because it seems to me that uh, Barack Obama and his campaign and the, the kind of connection that he's making with the American people was really foretold by Albert Murray's Omni-American. As my four-year-old uh, Omni-American, African-American, Irish-American, uh, granddaughter Ava Callahan Taylor said when, when I asked her what her mother was doing in Nevada a week ago, she said on the telephone, she therefore the Barack Obama. I said, who? She said, the Barack Obama. So it was kind of a kind of an incantation. I said, well, by God, this, this little girl, four-year-old girl gets it. Um, the Barack Obama. I think he, if he gets in difficulty, he could put Ava, my granddaughter Ava, up against Bill Clinton, and I don't think there'd be much question about who would the American people would choose at this point. Here again, in, in, this, in this place, in, in, in this marvelous uh, symposium today about Albert Murray, and not just about Albert Murray, one of the, one of the uh, compelling and moving things about, about the papers today, and I think Albert will be, and were, were he here, and will be when he sees the, uh, the CDs of, uh, of the papers, really all about the kind of vision of America that Albert Murray and his sidekick and collaborator and dear friend Ralph Ellison were, were attempting to uh, embody and create and project uh, more than 50 years ago. Um, and, um, and again, I, and, and so in this, in this place I'm tempted and I'm going to do it. Uh, I'm going to recall uh, among teachers, many teachers here, uh, my best on the American moment in some 40 years of teaching. I went to Lewis and Clark when I was 25 in 1967 and um, to uh, write my dissertation in absentia and uh, get a couple of years of teaching under my belt and life plays tricks on you. I'm, I'm, still, I'm still there. I, I think I am anyway. Um, and uh, Lewis and Clark had few African-American students and over the years we've had few. The admissions department would, 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 would rather, they'd rather have trips. They'd rather go to the big schools, big high schools in Los Angeles, Chicago, and other places than tend their own garden. Uh, the kind of, uh, the, the, the parishes, the black churches in Portland, the connections we have. But in any case, that's, a, that's not a story for, for this uh, occasion. But the best Omni-American moment I've had as a teacher was when, was sometimes in the late 1980s, and and uh, the English department, the enrollments were kind of low and, and, uh, in the English department. Uh, and um, so I offered to teach my African-American literature class as a lecture class in a big, in a big hall. And, and I drew 65 students, and 11 of them were African-American students. And I, you know, it was the first time ever, I think, I had, or any, perhaps any class, that had double digits. So we were, we would have been on the televised presidential debates had we been running. So there were 11 black students in the class, and, and this was in the late 80s, and there was a wonderful kind of tableau before me on, on, on the first day. And, and uh, there were black students. They were kind of pretty much scattered through the, through the room. And, uh, but in the, in the very first row, with, there was a guy with a, yeah, he had a, re a red and black bandana uh, on, on and he had a ponytail, and I don't think he was an Omni-American. I think he just was a woof folk, what Sterling Brown used to call a woof folk, a white folk. And I knew, I knew something was going to come down, and sure enough, after I did my little intro, he raised his hand uh, in, 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 in a very Yankee. It was actually a kind of what we are talking about, the uh, Constance Rourke earlier today. Uh, it wasn't an Omni-American voice. It was distinctly a white New England voice said, I'm here to learn about black literature and black writers, and how can you, a white man, presume to teach me this stuff? And, and he kind of went on. I, I, I tried to hear him out, and, and, uh, and then I began to respond. 
and he just cut me off. You know, he was he was really he was really on it, and I thought I was back in a, I was in a time warp. I thought I was back with with Tom Hayden and uh, God say it was in, in 1968. And all of a sudden, at the very rear of the room, this kind of hefty young black woman stood up and pointed her finger at this guy and she said, hush your mouth. Hush your mouth, boy. She said, I'm here to learn. Dr. Callahan knows something, I think I'm going to find out. I think he knows something about these writers and I want to learn, so you hush your mouth. And I never heard a word from this guy ever again, and you know the reason, he dropped the class. And, so, <laughs> and that, was, that was the best. Uh, I, think, I guess it would have been a better on the American moment if he'd stuck around. But like so many of his breed, he did not stick around. He went on to uh, different pastures. Um, so it, it really is a, a pleasure to be here uh, tonight. And, and I hope, actually, and rather suspect that the way life goes, that. Perhaps the future biographer of Albert Murray is among you in this room. Uh, I hope so, because I attempted, as Ralph's friend, Ralph Ellison's friend and, and his literary executor, I did the best I could to give some advice to uh, Herr Dr. Professor Arnold Rompersad. Uh, and I had been involved, with, along with Mrs. Ellison, others really, in, in, in you know, cooperating with Arnold and, 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 and uh, cutting the arrangement with him to do the, the biography of Ralph Ellison. And I said, look, uh, Honor, you got to do, do what you want. We're not going to do an authorized biography, none of that stuff. We, we're going we're to kind of uh, take our chances, as you have to take your chances. You'll have complete access to the papers. Uh, and he said, well, what would, what's your advice? I said, well, I have some advice for you. And, but the most important thing, in my judgment, is that the, there is no more primary source for your biography than Albert Murray. Uh, he, he, he's still in pretty good health. You can interview him, uh, and, and you should, because Albert Murray uh, knew Ralph Ellison for 60 years. Well, uh, and then along the way, and I'll get to this in a minute, uh, along the way, uh, Albert and I, uh, through Albert's insight and, and really very moving humility and generosity. Albert and I did the uh, did trading twelves. Now it didn't come out until 2000, but Ron Prasad had the had the tip on it, and, and uh, he was still very much in progress on his biography. And when that came out, I made sure he got a copy right away. I said, "Look, here's your gold mine." Arnold. Well, Arnold did not take that advice of mine, and I'm sorry he didn't. And uh, but it's the silver lining in the cloud is I think that Arnold's biography opens up future work, future biographies on, uh, on Ralph Ellison. But I very much hope that whoever uh, among you or beyond you uh, decides to write a biography of Albert Murray, and God knows he needs a, a splendid biography, will realize that that correspondence between Murray and Ellison trading 12s, and that's really the, the topic of my, my address tonight, uh, really uh, yields enorm incredibly intense and comprehensive insights about Murray. All of the things I heard discussed today in the papers, Murray's in, in, in entire uh, concept and his thematic grasp of what it means to be an American, what it means to be uh, an artist, what it means crucially to be a friend is on display richly and abundantly in that, uh, in that correspondence. So I hope that uh, that, that future biographer will, uh, will take, my, uh, take my advice. Um, <clears throat> now, I think that Trading Twelves is really the great, uh, the great American literary correspondence of the 20th century. Uh, if, Heming if Ernest Hemingway, and here I suppose I, I would differ slightly with my friend uh, Albert Murray, if Ernest Hemingway had been more resilient more of a blues man in his personal life uh, and more generous, I think uh, he and Scott Fitzgerald would have developed a correspondence that would have been uh, exceedingly rich. It's important as it is, but Hemingway really wouldn't respond to some of Fitzgerald's letters, and he got combative and competitive 
I wish he, Hemingway had been more of a jazz man in the way that Albert Murray and Ralph Ellison were jazz men because the letters would have reflected that uh, more. But uh, in any case, the, there is no other correspondence that I know of in 20th century American letters. One thinks a little bit of the 19th century and, and uh, again, a brief, somewhat fragmentary correspondence between Nathaniel Hawthorne and Herman Melville. But there simply isn't a correspondence in my judgment, that equals that between uh, Ralph Ellison and uh, Albert Murray. And it's fundamentally a correspondence of friendship. And because it's a correspondence of, uh, of friendship, it sheds uh, really blind, it, it, it sheds very much light on, on American culture, music, literature, politics, family, and uh, because of those things, uh, friendship. And friendship is the thread of the correspondence. And I want to tell you a little bit about how the volume uh, happened, because it was, uh, it was Albert Murray's, well, a Albert Murray's the person who came forth. I remember, and, 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 and unfortunately, the only kind of minor, it wasn't even a quarrel, that I, a quibble I'd have with Barbara's uh, really wonderful introduction. She, she talked about uh, wine and beer and scotch, but really the trigger for Trading 12s might have been Jameson's Irish whiskey. I, I'm not sure. I would tell you a brief story about it, it, about about Allison. One of the uh, well, that was kind of a, a, a crucial thread in my friendship with Ralph, because I'd written the essay and uh, gone to see him and sat across from him in in his uh, in his living room. We sat on leather couches opposite a in a, a, a glass uh, Italian coffee table and, and for I looked at my watch when we were seated and it was five after four and we went back and forth for 50 minutes Mr. Ellison and Mr. Callahan and Mr. Callahan and Mr. Ellison and you know if you hadn't known you Ellison was a vernacular man from Oklahoma and I was you know a developing vernacular man or as they say about Barack I guess a worst thing they say about him now is a young he's a young talented black man they keep putting it adjective in there, young, and that's supposed to wake people up, I guess. Uh, anyway, I was from up the line in New Haven, and you, you never would have known it. You'd have, thought, uh, you, you'd have thought that we were, you know, characters out of one of the later novels of Henry James. It was so formal and so unvernacular. <laughs> and, and I recall looking at my watch about, and it was five minutes to five, and I'd never been sure whether it was the academic hour or the therapeutic hour. You know, it's a tough choice. Which one do you want? You say none of the above, I guess. Uh, anyway, at five minutes to five, uh, I looked up, and, and, and Ellison brought his hand down on the table. Well, John, would you like a drink? And I was about as naive as his character. I was about as naive as Invisible Man. I said, well, why, yes, mister. What? Sure, Ralph. And he smiled. That's better. He would always lapse into a, his Oklahoma draw when he felt pretty good or when he felt pretty bad. And, uh, and he disappeared into the kitchen and he returned after a couple of minutes and he had a bottle of Jack Daniels in a glass and he put it on his side of the table. And he had a bottle of Irish whiskey, Jameson's it was, in a glass and he put it on my side of the table. And, uh, you know, they said, what star, well, a friendship was born. And, and it was cemented with the bourbon and, and Irish whiskey. And we moved to martinis, Fanny's lovely crystalline martinis on su subsequent occasions. But there's a little coda to this story because I don't know about you, but when, when I strike up a friendship with somebody and it kind of shows itself, I think, in trading 12s, you always kind of want to, you know, one up the other person. There is, there, there, if friendship involves cutting sessions, just like jazz does. And uh, anyway, about 10 years into the friendship, 10 or 12 years, I was at the Ellison home, summer home in the Berkshires, and uh, it was Wad Ralph was showing me around the place. He, he wanted to show me his tractor and uh, went out, and, and all of a sudden it hit me. Now's the time to ask the question. And I said, well, Ralph, can I ask you something? He said, well, sure. And I said, you know, I've, I've wondered for more than 10 years, Ralph, what the hell would you have done with the Irish whiskey if you hadn't liked me? Well, you know, you just couldn't do that with Ralph Ellison. He didn't live there. And he looked at me, and this is instructive in our 
present moment, I think, in American history and American culture. He just looked at me uh, and shook his head and he said with a hint, a soupçon of disappointment, if not disgust, for God's sake, John, I like Irish whiskey too. <laughs> you could not get Ralph Ellison behind the stereotypes of race that this country has devised. You couldn't get Ralph Ellison to bite on those stereotypes, on those categories. So I think I learned from this because um, uh, some uh, five years later, after Ralph had passed away and Juneteenth had come out, uh, uh, and Albert Murray had, had very graciously uh, read from Juneteenth uh, at the, uh, the, the kind of kickoff for that, for that, uh, that volume at the uh, New York City's flagship Barnes & Noble store. So I, I was in New York a month or two later, and I went, I went to his house and uh, to you know, just tell him personally how, how grateful I was. And, and I brought, for some reason, a bottle you, I guess you know the reason, I brought a bottle of Jameson's Irish whiskey and, uh, and gave him the whiskey. And, and he, he took the whiskey and thanked me. And, and, and I was about to leave, and he, he came, he went back into his uh, little alcove study, and he merged with this packet of letters. And he said, John, I, I, you know, I, I want to give you these letters. These are letters that Ralph wrote me from 1950 to 1960, and I think they ought to be published. And I just want you to read them, and if you got some an hour tomorrow, maybe you have to talk to, to Fanny, but come back the next day. Well, I, I took them and read them overnight, and, and, it, and it struck me. They were wonderful letters. Albert has read some of them in public, wonderful letters. And, um, it struck me that the, the only thing missing was his letters, because Ellison was referring to the letters that Albert had, had written him, uh, and, and, and it was a close correspondence. So uh, I managed to see Fanny the next day, and uh, she said, "Look, fine, you know, because uh, my notion was, well, you know, that, that if 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 Albert had saved his letters, or we had them in Ralph's files, and I, actually we did." Uh, then it would be a marvelous book of, uh, as, as correspondence. So I went back to, to, to Albert's place, and uh, he didn't offer me any of the Irish for an, for an hour until we got our business done. He was a smart guy. And, uh, and I said, look, Albert, uh, you know, y y I, I think that these would work as a correspondence. And he was so, uh, you know, he, he wasn't unproud, but he was humble. He said, look, these are Ralph's letters. I don't know if people would be interested in mine. I said, Albert, I'm convinced that they would. Uh, and uh, his resistance melted, and he said, "Well, look, I want you. I want you to read them, and I'll read them all together, and 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 we will we will see." And so that really is uh, that really is is the, the the kind of genesis, the the beginning of of trading twelves, um, because Albert uh, Albert was a very generous guy, and the last thing that he wanted to do was in any way to poach on what he knew was Ralph Ellison's uh, greater reputation as, as, as a writer. But we talked about it, and, and he, he agreed. He said, read mine and, and see, and we checked it out. And so that, that was the beginning of, of Trading Twelves. And uh, along the way, I think, uh, memory plays funny tricks, but we had a, a prosaic title, and, uh, and he had actually talked to me about Trading Twelves. The phrase he talked to me often about the uh, well, not so much talked to me as invoked the in chorus and the out chorus. I think I have a, an out chorus for this talk that you will you will like. We'll we'll see. Um, but anyway, uh, both of us independently, uh, see, when when the Random House people said, well, you know, we can't we can't just say you know letters of, of of Ralph Ellison and Albert Murray. So both of us independently made the suggestion to the modern library editor, why don't we call it <laughs> Trading Twelves? I think that kind of, uh, uh, that confluence really did seal the friendship between uh, me and, uh, between Albert Murray uh, and me. Well, let me say a little bit about the correspondence. I, I want to quote from it somewhat uh, liberally uh, tonight. The correspondence <coughs> goes from January of 1950 to June of 1960. And as I implied earlier, uh, the, the correspondence reveals a friendship 
It reveals two men who are extremely comfortable uh, and natural with each other. Uh, the, the, the best kind of, 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 of symbiosis, a mutually uh, beneficial relationship and, and connection between these two, between these two men. Um, and, uh, and again, some quirky things that you might not have uh, picked up if you just leaf through the letters. Uh, Albert, and perhaps this has to do with his military bearing, I'm not sure, he signs his letters Murray. There are only two of them. All the letters he writes, it. there are only two letters that he, that he signs uh, Albert. Uh, and one of them, it's very, it's very actually, it's very touching because he has a mild, what, what he calls, and Ellison scoffs at him, a mild heart attack uh, when he is, uh, when he is, uh, he's in uh, Algeria. Uh, well, at the same time, in the mid-50s, 50, I guess it's 55, 56, 55, 57. The same time Ralph is at the American Academy in Rome, Murray all of a sudden uh, accidentally discovers that he's had, they discover some damage on the electrocardiogram and they give him bed rest and so on, they treat him differently. But anyway, he has the heart attack and that, that, that puts a scare into him. And I think he's 41. So he's, he's, he's had, you know, he's kept it going for 50 years. That's the kind of guy he is. Life may be a low down dirty trick, but it's a trick that uh, Albert Murray doesn't want to turn his back on. Bless him for that. In any, in any case, uh, this particular letter, uh, he signs Albert. He signs it Albert. So you see in that the kind of sensibility, the kind of delicate, uh, fragile quality, wonderfully fragile quality of their relationship. Well, Ralph responds to this letter, and it's the one time that, uh, you know, he first couple of letters he, he'll sign, uh, he'll say Murray, but he settles into Albert, and he uses Albert uh, for, for, the, for the duration of the correspondence, except in his response to this letter. And this is one of the points that I want to make, and, and, and may, maybe there's a future biographer of Ralph Ellison in the, in the audience tonight, and if so, that person will, will, consulting these letters carefully, will see that like any deep and abiding friendship in the bones, friendship in the bones, uh, these men summoned qualities in each other that they didn't often have on display. And I think this is perhaps particularly true uh, for Ralph Ellison. Uh, in any case, the, Ralph responds to Albert's letter about the heart attack, and he, his salutation is, Dear old Albert, O-L-E, dear old Albert. And he writes, uh, you know, uh, it's not a sappy, a soppy letter, but it's a tender letter. And the, 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 uh, the way he signs it off is, is as follows, because again, it suggests uh, reaches of tenderness in Ralph Ellison, that Ralph Ellison, as an old school guy, man, African-American man, didn't put on easy or ready display. So he signs off love to lovable mokable. That was a nickname for Moselle. And, 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 and the nickname for Michelle was uh, uh, <coughs> Miquelable. Uh, so he signs it love to lovable, mokable, and miquable from Ralphable. Now, you don't have to say anything else. You don't have to say another word. And, and one wishes, or not one, but I wish that some of that, just a little bit of it, perhaps, that leaked into the, uh, uh, the, the biography of Arnold Rompersad that's been called magisterial, and, and perhaps that is indeed the right word, uh, although the, the person who gave that blurb might not have intended it. Who knows? Um, in any case, uh, each, each, each man summons and calls to the best qualities in the other. And often for Ralph Ellison, in my judgment, uh, Murray, Al Murray, summons Ralph's wild, uproarious side. Uh, and, and, and also, as well as the tender side, I mentioned the, the, the tender side again, because uh, in, uh, before Invisible Man comes out, I mean, the letters are fascinating because there's a, they, they really get going. Uh, they, 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 they really get trading twelves. Before Invisible Man, and Ellison is, is as uh, interested and intensely so about Murray's work in progress as Murray is about Ralph's work in progress. And of course, uh, hell, Ellison hadn't published a novel 
Not many people knew who the hell Ralph Ellison was. And so there's a kind of democratic equality that goes through this correspondence from start to finish. So Ellison uh, gets very excited when, when Murray sends him his book and says, who knows, maybe we'll have books published in the same year. And it gives Ellison an enormous pleasure to write that to Albert Murray. Uh, at the same time, also, there's a kind of, there was a, a wild side, an uproarious side to Ralph Ellison uh, that few people know of, and they could find out if they wanted to talk to uh, Albert. Well, they wouldn't even have to talk to Albert Murray. Just read, this, read these letters, and they would find it out. Uh, he writes back to Murray about Invisible Man, and he mentions his editor. His, his editor is, that was Albert Erskine, and he, he's, he writes this. And think, of, think if you've heard this kind of uh, uproarious riffing from Ralph in his prose uh, before, uh, accepting perhaps some of his fiction. Erskine's having a time deciding what kind of novel it is. And I can't help him. For me, it's just a big, fat old Negro lie meant to be told during cotton picking time over a water bucket full of corn with a dipper passing back and forth at a good fast clip so that no one, not even the narrator himself, will realize how utterly preposterous the lie actually is. I just hope someone points out that aspect of it. As you see, I'm more obsessed with this thing now than I was all those five years. Well, I don't think there's a similar revelation uh, from Ralph Ellison anywhere, but uh, there it is for, for, to uh, Albert Murray. Um, Ralph also is incredibly generous. Uh, that these, these two men are both very generous to about each other's manuscripts. For example, uh, this is what Ralph writes to, uh, to Al Murray after he and Fanny Ellison have both read his, his book. Uh, and, and notice that Ralph, in his praise, in his generosity, is also a truth teller to his friend Albert, as is Albert to Ralph, and I'll get to that in a minute. Without delay, let me say that we both think that you've written yourself a book. I found it beautifully evocative and poetic. Indeed, I'm not sure it fits a novel or a narrative poem. Well, uh, there, are, there are many uh, more, uh, more qualified Murray scholars in this room than, 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 than am I, and so you, so you will know if you've consulted the, the manuscripts and the rest of it, that that was one of the precise things that kept this manuscript on the boil for, for more than, than 20 years. Uh, and, 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 and notice the deft and gentle and generous way that Ralph uh, makes that point to, uh, to uh, Albert. And, and again, in the same letter, he, he says this, and uh, this, and, and, and as, as I learned today uh, from, uh, I think it was Professor McGuire's paper, this is something that, uh, that Albert Murray addressed in the intervening time. So, but Ralph says this, he says, um, for a while I, I, dis I disagree with hardly any of your narrator's formulation on the nature of fiction, nor with his theories of jazz, etc. I think the reader is deprived of his, the reader's adventure, because here you turn from presenting process to presenting statements. You turn from presenting process to presenting statements. And here I you know, have a, a, you know, a comment to make as Ralph's friend, and exec literary executor and editor. Uh, it, that is, in my judgment, and you will see this perhaps when the modern library uh, edition of the selected manuscripts from the second novel comes out, that is precisely the difficulty with uh, Ralph's subsequent revisions made uh, on the computer, uh, chiefly in the 1980s and early 1990s. Uh, less, uh, less, uh, crack the, less the narrative crackle, less narrative tension, and more, uh, more statements, more essayistic stuff. Well, uh, I think Al Murray benefited from that, uh, those comments of, uh, of, of, of Ralph's. And, uh, and here is Al Murray's response to Ralph's letter, and it is, uh, it is, it is wonderful. 
it's certainly a wild burst of learned African-American vernacular. And I'll, I'll, read, uh, I'll read a bit of it. Um, he's, he's talking about uh, what, what, he, what he was up to in this, in this book. Um, he says, um, there are some other Bop riffs that I did hope would operate. Miss Eunice was rendered in Bop and is supposed to operate crucially. I felt that the only, <coughs> that this was the only way to render her this time, since she's going to be used again. Eunice means happy victory, man, and I can't say a hell of a lot about that yet. In my mind, it also suggests union, oneness, equilibrium. Notice that the full name is Eunice Purifoy. I was hip to eunuch implications, too, but in the sense of unreadiness, unfitness. Remember, this guy must fear abortions in the sense that he is unready. He is a eunuch, and I described her to look, like, to look as much like that Egyptian princess that Mazel looks like as I could. But in another sense, he's not a eunuch at all, but a prince in disguise, preparing to, well, he's running around with Falstaff and them. Well, <coughs> you, get the, you get the sense of, of, of Albert's uh, riff. And likewise, when, <coughs> when Ralph uh, delivers his address, upon receiving the National Book Award, brave words for a startling occasion. This is uh, the response that Murray gives him. Proteus is the right kick, boy, and it's my kick too. Both the writer and the hero have got to learn to riff on it. You got to be nimble or nothing. I keep trying to tell them and myself too. So you see here, uh, very movingly, I think, the way that these two guys rarely would write about simply about uh, one of the, their work or the other guy's work. Inevitably, these letters are about what they were both up to in their different ways as, uh, as, as artists. Um, I also want to use Ralph Ellison and use these letters to, to show how much and Ralph Ellison believed in Albert Murray's brilliance and his, original, his originality as a thinker and a writer. It's clear uh, very early. It's clear uh, in this letter, in 19, written in 1953. I hope you'll get to work, uh, I hope you'll get work done on your book and that you'll start turning out essays on jazz <coughs> which can later be part of a book. You have the stuff. And I think it'll do you good to have part of your identity anchored outside Tuskegee. Thus far, you've stayed there and transcended its limitations. You, you evolved the stuff, so now put it on the line. You're the only one I know who makes sense of all the ramifications. And since it looks like no one is going to do anything with this material, we might as well get started. I love that transition from you and I to we. This is a common goal that, that, that Ralph Ellison and Albert Murray shared, and, and, and certainly each of them was of the mind that they would not realize their uh, objective, their project, unless each guy uh, made a distinctive uh, and connected contribution to that, uh, to that project. Uh, also, uh, Murray always in this correspondence, and, and here we, we kind of move into this period after Invisible Man, and, uh, you know, when one thinks about the, uh, the phrase democratic equality, and one thinks of how often in this country it is honored in the breach, not the observance. We see all we need to see of that these days uh, right now. Uh, never was that the case, so far as I can tell, with the Murray Ellison correspondence or relationship. Whatever tensions might, <coughs> might have uh, come into play came into play on the basis of equality uh, between these two, the, the, these two Omni-Americans. Uh, so when Murray writes back to, to Ralph about uh, 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 some, some stuff, some riffs that Ralph had sent him from the first novel, and Murray saw it first, nobody else saw it, this is what he writes. And, and, and notice the, the, the wonderful playfulness of this. Uh, you can see why you all and I love Albert Murray. You writing good, boy. Real good. Blowing good, cutting good, keen and deep. If you getting any of this stuff working in there with old Cleophas in them, you st still swinging that switchblade, and you ain't got nothing to worry about. 
For my money, you're in there with that shit, man. Me, I've finally begun to get a few notes down for that jazz novel I've got to take a crack at. I mean, you just see the way these guys energize uh, each other. And uh, again and again, uh, Ralph uh, calls on Murray to write his stuff. And there's one uh, passage I'm, I'm going to read. I don't want to go over too much, but I, I want to read this because uh, Ralph has been very frustrated by Stanley Edgar Hyman's take on, on folklore uh, and take on, 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 the, on the black hero and various other things. And this is what he says uh, to Murray. And, and this, again, is in 1957. Hell, Hyman don't know that Ulysses is both Jack the Rabbit when that Cyclops gets after his ass and Jack the Bear, Big Smith the Chef, John Henry, and everybody else when he starts pumping arrows into those cats who've been after his old lady. Or if he does recognize this, and it's only with his mind, not his heart. I was especially disappointed with his treatment of the blues. For a while he lists a few themes, he restricts their meaning. <coughs> For a while he lists a few themes, he restricts their meaning to a few environmental circumstances. Mose can't write. Hey, what was that? Where'd that happen? Is that a light? Hey, this is not South Carolina, Clinton. Get back there then. Go, go back north, man. <laughs> so, um, Mose can't rise vertically, so he's restless. He can't get a good job here, so he goes there, missing the fact that there is a metaphysical restlessness built into the American, and Mose is just another form of it, Express, expressed basically with a near tragic debunking of the self, which is our own particular American style. I really thought I'd raise that boy. I mean, I really thought I'd raise that boy better than that. But hell, I keep telling you, Albert, that you're the one who has to write about those blues. Uh, again, you read that and you think, God, who is this speaking, writing? Is this Ellison? Is this Murray? You really see the, the kind of symbiotic uh, back and forth between these two guys, and I think it's, I think it's extraordinary. Um, now, uh, Ellison continues to do this, and, and again, unlike so many writers, and some of you, I know Don would, would, would know this, I mean, uh, in, in 1925, Ernest Hemingway gave Scott Fitzgerald the, the beginning of The Sun Also Rises, and it's not, it ain't the beginning that he published. And Fitzgerald said, look, you, why don't you cut this stuff? And he made kind of Ezra Poundian suggestions. Well, Hermie Hemingway was not capable of T.S. Eliot's generosity to Ezra Pound. He always denied that Fitzgerald had ever seen the damn thing, okay? Uh, now, Ellison helped Murray, but Albert Murray is the first person to want to tell the world about the help that he got from Ralph Ellison. Uh, so Ralph, uh, in, in Murray's testimony and other, tes other evidence too, Ralph, did, Ralph Ellison did not just walk the walk, uh, he talked the talk. And, and I, and I want to I read, uh, read, uh, read this because uh, Murray is the person who, who talks about uh, this. He says, when I was settled in New York and turned my full attention to the literary material that I had been accumulating over the years, my first published item was a long review of several books that life asked me to do because Ralph had suggested that one of the literary editors get in touch with me. It was also upon Ralph's generous recommendation that editor Myron Kovach asked me to do reviews for the new reader. My collegial relationship with Ralph also led to my personal and professional relationship with Willie Morris, who was editor-in-chief of Harper's not only published an episode from my novel, Train Whistle Guitar, but also gave me the assignment that turned into South to a very old place. Uh, I've been around long enough to know you can't write that kind of stuff unless you're comfortable in your own skin. And Albert Murray is comfortable in his own skin. Um, okay, I want to say, speak briefly about the, about the, the, the last phase in, in, this, uh, in, this, in this correspondence. It, it goes from 1958 to 1960. Murray is in Los Angeles, Long Beach to be exact, with the Air Force, and Ralph is back in uh, New York. And uh, <clears throat> again, just to 
the sheer uh, keen keenness and brilliance of, of Albert Murray as a, a kind of witness to and a commentator on the American scene. He writes this to Ralph about California. So far, what I've seen of this part of Southern California has been mostly boom town stuff. A big, shiny supermarket, even the homes and gardens seem to have been bought in a supermarket. Pithy, terse, on the case. Albert Murray, 1958, in California for a month, and he nails it. Um, and a couple of other things, that, some of these are, 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 are comic. Uh, one is, and Ralph really, uh, you know, greatly respected Murray as a teacher, uh, and they talked about teaching very often. That didn't stop uh, Ralph, however, from uh, riffing, woofing, signifying on, on, on teaching his own stint at Bard, and he would, you know, sometimes take counsel with Albert, uh, and this is something that he wrote that is a riff on his own experience, but it makes a much larger cultural point, and I think perhaps it's, it's, it's worth uh, putting it uh, out there into the air tonight. As for the teaching, I guess I'm beginning to learn some of the things you've known for a long time, you know, each apprentice to the other at times. It went, it went rather well, but I was appalled with how ignorant some of these bright progressive school products can actually be. Not only of literature, but of life. They wear beards and let their unwashed tits bounce around in their low-cut blouses and are still literally chewing bubble gum. I'm told I'm a popular teacher, but if so, I did it the hard way around. They all expect to be entertained, but I played the dozens at them and signified about them in so many different ways that I don't think they found many places to hide from confronting the connection between their identities, social and personal, and the major concerns of the American novel. <coughs> I wasn't nice at all, Albert. I hit them with their ignorance of the experience and their easy smugness toward the South, then tried to shake some of the shit out of their vague and inflated notions concerning the superiority of European fiction. Um, so that was Ralph to Murray on teaching and what he says he had learned from, uh, from Albert Murray. Uh, also, I think that some of the best stuff that Ralph wrote about his concept for the second novel uh, was written to uh, Albert Murray, and, and I, and I want to read a, a brief passage about, about this. Uh, it, again, it was written in, in 1960. Uh, and again, it, it also, this passage also uh, points up a conflict within Ellison that Murray identified very early. And that was, that Ralph's, ten that was Ralph's tendency to accept invitations to write essays about American literature and American culture, and in so doing, put aside the novel that he had worked so long on. And, Murray is gentle, but he is straight up about that, and, 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 and it seems to me that it, it was one of the things that got in the way uh, of Ralph finishing that, that second novel, unlike some of the, some of the rather preposterous psych psychoanalytic, psychoanalytic slash racialist theories that are put forth in, in Rapperside's biography and, and other works on, on Ellison. Uh, so he says this, nevertheless, I'm still planning to put together a book of essays. Right now, I'm working up a piece on Negroes in Southern fiction titled The Seer and the Scene for an anthology edited by some Southern boys and scheduled by Anchor. If this goes well, I'll use it along with the other stuff. I've been finding interesting things about Hemingway and Fitzgerald, which might well work into a broader piece on the same subject. And this, when you start lifting up that enormous stone, the Civil War, that's kept so much of the meaning of life in the North hidden, you begin to see that Mose, word for the black man, black person, that Mose is in the center of a junk pile as well as in the center of the cotton bowl. All the boys who try to escape this are simply running from the problem of value, which is why those old Negroes whom I'm trying to make Hickman represent are so confounding 
They never left the old, original, yes, briar patch. You can't understand Lincoln or Jefferson without confronting them. And then <clears throat> here is Ralph, uh, a 50-page excerpt from his second novel from book two, which is in <coughs> Juneteenth, uh, the lead piece in Saul Bellow's new short-lived, it turned out, magazine, Noble Savage. Ellison wanting to see Murray to have this and also wanting Murray to be a fellow author in this very coveted new magazine. This is what he writes to uh, Albert, and this will be the last quote I will read from the correspondence. Dear Albert, I had Fanny get off a copy of The Noble Savage to you a couple of weeks ago, but have been so busy that only now am I getting around to the follow-up letter. I hope it gives you some idea of what we're up to, although I'm not a very active editor at the moment. And I hope you'll let us see something of what you're writing. There is quite an interest in the mag, and few detractors have sounded off against it. And few detractors have sounded off against the title even before the paper was available. At any rate, we're out to provide a magazine which will make it unnecessary for a good writer to even think about partisan review or Hudson or any of the academic house organs. And any criticism we publish will be by the writers, not the critic. Best of all, we have a top word rate of five cents per, which ain't bad at all. Uh, that was uh, Ralph Ellison to, to, to Murray. Please write something for the magazine. Again, uh, democratic equality and generosity, this, this uh, is at the core of their friendship. Uh, well, as a, as a coda, I, you know, try to think of what, what could be said about uh, Albert Murray. And it occurred to me that, that I shouldn't speak in closing with my own words, but I should, I should uh, read you something that, that Ellison wrote during this very period. It's a, it's a section, it's a brief passage from the second novel, written in 1959 or 1960. And it is part of, the, the, it's part of book two, it is part of, of Juneteenth. And I can't think of a finer, more accurate uh, uh, appreciation, uh, assessment, and tribute to uh, Albert Murray than this. And, I, and, I, and I'll, so I'm going to close by reading this, this passage, this paragraph from, um, from uh, Juneteenth, as it turns out, and say also that, that, that I, I think I have two regrets about, about decisions that Ralph Ellison made. The first one is, and it's, it's surely a wild gut hunch. I, I wish he had turned down the Schweitzer chair and said, hell, I'm not taking anything like that. I've got to finish this second novel. And secondly, and possibly even more uh, fervently, I wish that he had uh, been sharing the manuscript with, with Albert Murray. Uh, well, anyway, this is what he, this is what he wrote. And if, if you've, perhaps you, you have or haven't read Juneteenth. It's a scene, the scene where uh, Hickman is remembering sermons, ministers, the black church, the sacred calling, doing the Lord's work, which, of course, for Ralph and Albert Murray, the, the Lord's work was, was art. art. Art had a sacred calling about it, art, and also a patriotism in the way that they were American patriots. So here is Hickman uh, after the uh, Bliss Sun Raider, uh, the little boy he's raised who, who, who runs off from the black folks who've raised him becomes a racist senator from a New England state and is assassinated uh, by the son he has long denied. He's in the hospital. He's dying. He calls for Hickman to come, and Hickman gives him, uh, begins to remember. And this is kind of, uh, in a way, uh, a kind of out chorus from, uh, from Juneteenth. And uh, here it is. Anyway, Bliss, that night, Coming and, and the night described as a Juneteenth night, when uh, this crazy white woman comes in and tries to steal Bliss from the, from the black folks uh, in the congregation. Anyway, Bliss, that night, coming after Eatmore and Pompey and Reverend Brazelton, yes, and that little Negro Murray, who had been to a seminary up north and could preach the pure Greek and the original Hebrew and could still make all our uneducated folks swing along with him, who could make them understand and follow him, and not just showing off, 
just needing all those languages to give him room to move around in. Besides, that Murray knew that oft times the meaning of the word is the way you make it sound. No, now don't interrupt me. Save yourself. I know that you know these secrets. You have hurt us enough with them. But as I was saying, what's more important, Reverend Murray's education didn't get him separated from the folks. Yeah, and he used to sit there in his chair, bent forward like a boxer, waiting for the bell, with his fists doubled up and his arms on his knees. Then, when it came his turn to preach, he'd shoot forward like he was going to leap right out there into the congregation and start giving the devil some uppercuts. Lord, what a little rough mister. One night, he grabbed a disbelieving bully who had come out to break up the meeting and threw him bodily out into the dark, tossed him 15 feet or more into the mule-pissed mud. Then he came on back to the pulpit and preached like Peter. Yes, the senator said, I remember him. And may we always remember and cherish and pay homage to Albert Murray. Thank you. Yeah.